Uh, my name is Natalie Walker. I'm the manager of college operations at the Classic Learning Test, and I'm so glad you found your way here. Uh, we're going to be treated to a lecture by Dr. Elizabeth Stice, Associate Professor of History at Palm Beach Atlantic University, Assistant Director of the Frederick M. Supper Honors Program. Um, she did her PhD at Emory University, MA at University of Hawaii, and BA at Messiah University. Her specialty is World War I, and last year her book, Empire Between the Lines, Imperial Culture in British and French Trench Newspapers of the Great War, was published, so congratulations about that. Um, and before I continue, would you actually tell us just for a minute about um, the honors program at PBA? Give us some context. Yeah, well, it's hard to limit myself to a minute, but I'll try. So basically, we have a great books program as our honors program. And it really goes through your whole four years. So it, it more or less substitutes for a lot of the different parts of the core curriculum and tracks you all the way from ancient Greece and Old Testament up through the present day as much as we can. Um, though it's always really hard to get to the actual you know, year we're in or anything like that. Uh, and then students, so the students take that, they take it as a sequence, usually in order. There's a strong cohort model. So the people you come in with, you end up having classes with a lot which might sound like it's not great, but it actually is great. <laughs> it's probably one of the greatest things about the program is how close people become. And they also really get to know those professors. We have kind of a handful of people who teach within honors. So it's a really tight community. We have a house system, which is not actually housing, but kind of the other aspects of the Harry Potter system, if you will, or the British boarding school system where you do activities together and they're kind of grouped by affinities. So strong community, uh, classical learning, and the students take an oral exam at the end, which covers all four of those years. And we're actually in that season right now. I just did three this past week. And it's a little bit high stress, but it's also really high reward because then you're seeing that by the end, people, all the things people can link, it's really, really impressive. That sounds so excellent. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for being here. And thank you also for your flexibility with the rescheduling. Um, so after the lecture, there will be a question period, and we want to read your questions in the chat and get the chance to engage with them. So please use the chat freely. Um, if you address them to everyone, that's great. Or if you just want to address us, that's fine too. Uh, we're also lucky to be joined by a CLT student um, to help us with our inquiry into Hemingway. So thank you, Jonathan, for being here. Um, and you'll hear from him later. So that's all for me, Dr. Stice. The screen is yours. Thank okay, you. well, I'll do share screen. And I, as I said to Natalie, I'm going to try to do a more interactive lecture. So I'll throw kind of questions out there as well. So uh, Jonathan doesn't have to always be you, but, you know, just feel free to, to unmute yourself and throw in answers to things uh, as we go. And try not to go too fast or too slow, which I think is always a challenge. Um, with something like this, because if you're talking about anybody interesting, you can easily do way more than an hour on them, right? So it's always a bit of a challenge. So uh, Ernest Hemingway, kind of his life and works, uh, what we can do in the time frame we have. So Ernest Miller Hemingway, born in 1899 and died in 1961, which I think is just one of those really interesting time periods anyway. I think it would be hard to be a boring person born at the end of the 1800s and dying in the 1960s, right? You're going from basically before cars to people are thinking about getting on the moon. It's just hard to even imagine living in that time frame and not having some kind of interesting aspects about you. So those are, those are always my favorite people anyway. Um, there's a picture of him when he's young, looks a lot the same, right? Um, here's a picture of him with his family. He's the second child of six, right? There are two boys in the family and a bunch of sisters. His father, who you see there on the far left was a doctor. Uh, just a family doctor where they lived in Oak Park, Illinois. Um, this is before doctors really made a lot of money. So they were still very, very middle class and uh, middle, middle class. His mother was a music instructor. And sometimes she actually made more money than his father. So they weren't poor by any means, but they were not, um, you know, upper, upper middle class or anything like that. So he has a pretty typical American upbringing. Um, his mom teaches him music lessons, so he learns to play instruments when he's young. He goes to high school. He's involved with friends and things like that at high school. I think we've got him as a young man. Into all the sporting things from the beginning, uh, fishing, boxing, hunting, all of that kind of stuff. A little bit shy in high school, so we don't see all the aspects that we'll see later. Involved in the school newspaper. Um, just a pretty, pretty typical upbringing. 
one thing which stands out that's maybe not 100% typical is that he really didn't get along with his mom. <laughs> she was not a huge fan of him and he was maybe not a huge fan of her. They were maybe actually too similar, but they just didn't really see eye to eye. So he really loved his father, who was very gentle, but his mother could be very controlling. And she was often disappointed in him. And I think as we go, you'll see kind of why she was maybe not totally crazy to be disappointed in him at times. But there, there's definitely a lot of tension there where it was not not a great dynamic. And that continued just the longer, longer it went. So the older he got, the more he cared less for his mom and kind of vice versa. So that's that's an un, unhappy aspect to his youth. Um, so he finishes high school. And by that point, he graduates in 1917. The U.S. has actually finally entered World War I. We'll come to that in a second. And he wants to go, but he's not quite 18. And so his parents say no, because, I mean, they don't want to send their son to a world war. It's not unreasonable. And so he goes to Kansas City to work as a newspaper reporter for just a little bit. Um, and this is actually, a lot of scholars think that this has a huge effect on his his style as a writer, right? So in terms of newspaper writing, what do you, what do you guys know about newspaper writing for style? What are, what are some of the characteristics of that style? Incision, maybe? Yeah. Anybody on this school newspaper at any point? <laughs> I was not. Well, your editors hate adjectives. I can tell you that. <laughs> everything needs to be direct. Everything needs to be to the point. Um, they're trying to make everything fit into these little columns. So anything that you really can't back up with evidence is out. And anything that's there to be beautiful or kind of florid description, that's the absolute worst. So they're always making it just like tighter and tighter, right? More and more direct. And you're going to see that that's really a lot of how he writes his whole life. And so there's a there's a really good argument that this helps shape him, his early editing that he experienced at Kansas City. But then he finally does turn 18. And so he's off to the war, World War One. Right. Uh, the war started in 1914. The U.S. didn't get involved until 1917. He's now out of high school and he's 18. He's going to go. Um, but he's going to go as an ambulance driver. Um, he doesn't actually get accepted by the U.S. Army and he, he has bad vision. So American Red Cross Motor Corps in Italy. And a lot of American, famous, famous American writers went as ambulance drivers, actually. E.E. E. Cummings, John Dos Passos, and just several more. So it's a whole thing. I mean, they don't know when they're going. They're not thinking, I'm going to be an ambulance driver, and then I'm going to be a really famous novelist. But it just works out that way for a lot of them, um, which is kind of interesting, right? So World War I, I don't know. What do people know about World War I? It's not usually something people know a lot about in the U.S., Jonathan, any World War One knowledge? Um, I I was fair education in it. Mo mainly, I focused on more the political aspect on where the presidency and the impact that it had, especially with Woodrow Wilson, and how he, especially after the war, he saw himself as almost a hero, trying to bring his uh, what is it, points, his points. That ended up just completely backfiring on him. Yeah. Yeah, World War I is a really um, interesting war. It's a defining moment in Hemingway's life. It's a defining moment in the modern world as well. Because we have, um, yeah, foreign war not in U.S. interest. That's in the comment. A lot of people thought that for sure, right? Um, so World War I ends up having 20 million people killed, which is a huge shock because everyone in the late 1800s, early 1900s, for the most part, there's a real belief in progress and that the West is really becoming more and more civilized and more advanced. We're figuring out medicine, we're figuring out science. And then Europe kind of stumbles into this war more or less by accident. And then they're killing each other with poison gas and the weaponry is horrific and they have machine guns and it's the first military use of barbed wire and it's the first military use of airplanes and the tank gets invented. And a lot of people get really disenchanted <laughs> about life, about Western civilization, about all of that kind of stuff, right? Um, especially a lot of authors. There are a lot of really famous British and French authors who were in the war as well, especially poetry, right? People who are raised to think war is heroic and glorious. A lot of the people who were in college or went to college or even went to high school at that point were raised actually with a very classical background. 
So they're reading the Aeneid, they're reading the Iliad, they're reading the Odyssey, and they're thinking, war is this like glorious, noble, heroic thing, and I'm going to distinguish myself. And then they get there and they see people blown up by artillery shells and there's nothing left, right? They see bodies being eaten by rats, and they really start to rethink a lot of things, right? And Hemingway is, is one of those people. There's a lot of trauma involved in World War I. So he's an ambulance driver. He's not fighting um, with guns or anything like that. It's just some World War I pictures here. Right, you see the total destruction of the landscape. Um, these are all men who've been blinded by gas, right? So they're being led to the rear and then they have their hands on each other's shoulders so they can guide each other. All right, so this kind of thing would be a pretty regular sight. Here's young Ernest Hemingway in his uniform, very dashing, very handsome, right? There he is on crutches. That's because he gets injured. He gets really badly injured. So he's actually running things up to the front. He's dropping off, I think, like cigarettes and candy, things like that. And he basically gets blown up. Um, artillery shell lands right by him. And he's just totally hit by shrapnel everywhere, especially in one leg, but really kind of everywhere. He actually has 227 pieces of shrapnel in his body of varying sizes. So really serious. Um, there he is, part of his recovery. He almost dies. He actually has a near-death experience, which he writes about in one of his stories. He feels like his soul is leaving his body. So he thinks this is the end. Um, he has to have an immediate surgery and a lot of surgeries later. And he spends six months in the hospital, right? So this is a pretty traumatic thing, no matter what. And then while he's in the hospital, he also falls in love with his nurse, right? Uh, so Agnes von Karowski, and she's just a couple of years older than him, which, so she's in her early 20s, but he's like 19. So it feels big, but really it's not that big of a gap. And everything's kind of going great. He's recovering. They're going to get married. Um, he's going to go home and find a job. And then she's going to come over to America because she's actually um, like working over there still. And then everything really falls apart for him anyway. So it's, he has another trauma. He comes home and he's writing Agnes. And then Agnes writes back and says, you know, you're a sweet kid, but I met somebody else who's kind of more of a grown man. And, you know, it's nice knowing you and we'll always be friends, which he doesn't really see that way at all. And so he's back. He's recovering from his injuries still. He doesn't know what he wants to do. He's living at home, fighting with his mom. And he just got dumped by the person he thinks is the love of his life. So really this World War I period, it's only a couple of years of his life, but it's really gonna shape him in very significant ways. And it's gonna come up in pretty much all of his books. World War I is, if not the main text, will be the subtext in so many of the things that he writes and so much of the way that he thinks. Even this relationship becomes a subtext for a lot of his later relationships, trust issues, serious trust issues, um, and issues with long-term relationships, right? And so this kind of sets the stage um, so definitely at this stage, you can kind of feel really sorry for young Hemingway, who's who's been through a lot in just about 19, 20 years, right? But he bounces back, right? This is his backstory, but he meets somebody else. He meets Hadley Richardson, who's going to be his first wife. And they fall in love, and he's working for newspapers, and they get married in 1921, and they move to Paris. And this is really sort of like maybe the peak of his life in certain ways. It's this, this time period in Paris in the 1920s. Um, there he is. That's what you do when you move to Paris. You get a beret, you grow a little mustache and you pose so people know you're a serious writer, right? It's not enough to just live in Paris, you gotta look it. Right, there he is at the cafe, hanging out with people. There he is at Shakespeare and Company, a really famous bookstore that you can still go to in Paris, by the way, right? Uh, also bandage on his head, I believe. <laughs> he is a number of serious head injuries throughout his life, which is a whole other thing, um, right? There's James Joyce at Shakespeare and Company. So Paris in the 20s, it's really the place to be. I think we have, yeah, this is one of his favorite cafes. Everything is happening in Paris in the 20s. Paris in the 20s is super cheap. It's not like Paris today. Because World War I pretty much devastated Europe, Europe is a very cheap place to live after the war. And so a bunch of Americans go there and realize they can kind of have a great time in Paris. They can go out to eat all the time. They can drink all the time. They do drink all the time. A few writers move there. Then everyone decides they all need to move there. This is where he meets Fitzgerald. Gertrude Stein is there, right? Famous writer and critic who's going to help him get ahead. Uh, James Joyce is there. 
There are cafes, there are bars, there are horse races, there are ski trips. Hemingway's into all of that. <laughs> there are trips to the south of France, there's trips to Spain, there's trips to Italy. He's he's just really living his life. He and Hadley have a baby. And this is also when he takes off as a writer. This is when he becomes somebody in that respect as, as well. So he begins to find success as a writer of fiction. Um, there they are with the baby, right? His first big book, In Our Time, right? And this is a collection of stories. And this is a hit. This is a huge hit. And so Hemingway goes from basically nobody to that guy who wrote those stories. And you especially want to have him at your dinner party. And he's feeling pretty good as a writer. And then just a year later, The Sun Also Rises, which is also a great book. And now we have a, a full novel. Right, we were talking about this before, the short story is kind of this first step and then trying to get to a novel. There's actually one more novel, one more first novel, which is lost to history because he was, I forget, I think he might've been in Italy. I was coming to meet him and she had it in a suitcase on the train and then the suitcase got lost. So actually Hemingway's first novel, no one really knows, right? Which is a whole... You know, you could write a poem about that, the mystery, if, if someone could find it somewhere in an attic, you know, probably just went to the trash, but that would be great too. But he's he's on the scene now. He's a really big deal. He's famous. He knows he's famous. Other people know that he's famous. And so he has this sense of pride and the sense of arrival, right? And this is a special moment also in American literature, because in the early 20th century, there are a lot of exciting writers, some of which we still talk about all the time. And others we don't always talk about, but if you major in English, you will. Right, so John Dos Passos is another person who's around, actually will be friends with Hemingway for later, and then not friends, right? Because that happens as well. Uh, Sherwood Anderson is another one who is a really big deal at the time, but people don't talk about as much these days. And there's sort of an unofficial competition that's in the air in the 1920s. Does anybody know what it is that they're all competing for? What is it they want to do? The greatest American novel, the greatest novel. Yeah, the great American novel. Apparently it's a thing. It's one of Plato Plato's forms is the great American novel. And they want to be the person who, who hits it, right? And uh, what's the other major contender? Because Hemingway is considered a, a major contender. He might have done it, but there's somebody else who's his rival and friend who may also have done it. Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald, yeah, the great Gatsby. <laughs> a lot of people think, oh, the great Gatsby, that might be it, right? And so there's this tension between between them. And a lot of it's really on Hemingway's end. He's a hyper-competitive person. Fitzgerald is not necessarily a hyper-competitive person, but Hemingway has this whole thing about how authors can't really be true friends and they're always your rivals. And he has all these famous, famous quotes. And then also in his books, he very often will characterize his friends, but it will, it'll be in very demeaning ways. So he will, there will often be a character loosely based or very directly based on one of his friends who is just weak and pathetic and has terrible traits. And then that leads him to lose a lot of friends as well, as you might imagine, right? Because who, who wants that? Who wants to be memorialized in that kind of way, right? Um, we get a few more books as we move forward. Um, let's go. First, I guess, talk about like what's going on with these stories, what makes them special. One of the things with Hemingway is the way that he writes. So as we mentioned, he has that influence coming from his newspaper background, and he's known for this sparse, spare, clean prose, just like very clear, very direct. And that feels familiar to us now because we're living 100 years later. But at the time, that was revolutionary. That was modern. Nobody was writing like that, right? Uh, anybody read a lot of like 1800s novels, 19th century stuff? Yeah, a 19th century sentence, long or short. Very often very long, right? We get these like these long descriptions. And if it's someone's face, we're getting like the forehead and the brow and the chin and the cheeks. Like we get this, like you could do a sketch artist. You could do it from that. And Hemingway in the 20th century, suddenly people just don't aren't writing that way. Some people are, right? Even some people who are still really good. Um, I think Thomas Wolfe would be an example of that. He still has that long flowery prose, still one of those 20, 1920s, 1930s rivals. But Hemingway is sort of one of the pioneers of this more direct, clear style. 
um, and things that are implied rather than stated, right? So here's um, an example. Just a couple sentences from this big two-hearted river, which is one of his famous short stories, right? In this short story, we have a character who is basically just on a fishing trip, fishing and camping trip by himself. And it's nothing is ever said about the war, about the Great War, but it's really clear that the whole background is the Great War, right? That that's really what's going on. Um, and so we have this, this description, right? He felt he had left everything behind, the need for thinking, the need to write other needs. It was all back of him. He doesn't tell us what those other things actually are. <laughs> he doesn't tell us what this character needs to be thinking about, what he might be writing about, what these other needs might be. He leaves it all to us. And yet we get such a strong sense of what's going on with this character and what a relief this trip, this fishing trip is to him, right? And so there's a lot of that um, in the way that he does things. His perspective is that you need to be writing things that are true, just absolutely the truth. So one, when you're trying to figure out what to write, he says, all you have to do is write one true sentence, write the truest sentence you know. But his truth is also an unvarnished truth. And this is where he gets into more friction with his mom as though he needed that, right? He is not afraid to use profanity. He is not afraid to write about drunkenness, about premarital sex, not necessarily a description, but acknowledging that it's happening about bullfighting, he becomes kind of in love with these graphic things. Um, and that, people just aren't doing that. Uh, one of his stories in our in the book, In Our Time, actually involves state rape, right? And a lot of people were saying to him, you can't, you can't write about these things. And he's saying, that's what, that's what people live, that's what I'm gonna write about. His mom writes him a thing about how he's writing, you know, disgusting work, and it, no one should be talking about these types of things. There's one where he references venereal disease, and she says, no one ever talks about that. He's like, well, that's why I'm talking about it, right? Um, so his idea is that it's just this kind of unvarnished truth. Again, that's one of those things that now living 100 years later, the idea that it's not super censored and that he's very direct about the bad aspects of human life, not super shocking to us, but it was very shocking to people at the time, right? James Joyce was the same. Books were banned back then that wouldn't even be banned now for different, totally different reasons. Things that they mentioned that were, those are the least of our concerns, right? But that's kind of one of the things that's that's radical about that point in time. Um, the hits just keep on coming for a little bit, right? A Farewell to Arms in 1929 might even be his best, right? Many people think that this is the one where he's taking on the war directly right? Um, this is also where he starts to show more of his love for bullfighting. Um, and if we have time a little bit later, I might come back and read some passages where he's describing bullfighting. Uh, but it's it's gory and bloody and brutal. And you might think that a war veteran would not be into it, but he's, he's really into it. He actually has a whole other book that he writes just about bullfighting for the American audience so that we can learn to love it. Obviously, it's never really come here, so we've never totally learned to love it, but he had dreams. Right. And so things are going pretty well for him, but a few things are also starting to go not as well. Right. So the 1920s are this defining moment. This is also the era in which his father actually commits suicide in 1928. Right. So his father had depression for a lot of his life and he commits suicide in 1928. Um, just to show you more of that unhealthy relationship with his mother, she later sent him the gun. Like, oh, maybe you would want this. This is your father's gun. Now we might say, you know, I mean, you don't have to be a psychologist to wonder if that was the best move, but that's just shows you kind of the, the bad dynamic that they had, the lack of understanding between them about each other, right? Um, he has this other hit book, right? Farewell to Arms, which is very truthful about the war. He describes the Italian retreat, the Battle of Caporetto, which is just chaotic and brutal, right? Um, we see more of his very spare description in this book as well, even though it's long. This is also where we get one of his most famous quotes, which we say might even kind of summarize his understanding of life, right? The world breaks everyone. Many are strong at the broken, and afterward, many are strong at the broken places, but those that will not break it kills, kills the very good and the very gentle and the very brave impartially. If you are none of these, you can be sure that it will kill you too, but there will be no special hurry. Right, and I mean, this quote you see everywhere, but also, again, maybe kind of his life philosophy. Here's some bullfighting pictures, right? This is part of his love with Spain. He's in love with Spain. He goes there a lot. That's him later, 
But other things happen as well. He falls out of love with his wife and in love with a friend of hers, uh, Pauline Pfeiffer. And so he gets divorced and he marries Pauline and they're gonna be married for quite a while. And Pauline is actually gonna be probably one of the best supporters of his work that he has. Not only does she encourage him and read his writing and give him good feedback, she also has some family money. So he's able to spend all of his time writing and he's extremely disciplined as a writer. So even though he is not disciplined as a romantic partner or a drinker he, or a friend, he is very disciplined as a writer. That's one of the things that sets him apart and one of the reasons why he's able to produce so much good work, right? Um, they also spend some time down in Key West. They're gonna move down there, just him and, and Pauline later. Two more kids, he has two more sons, right? And this is the era in which Hemingway is cultivating his image. This is the other interesting thing about him. And this is where he totally excels via versus Fitzgerald or Dos Passos or Anderson or anybody. And that's creating this, this really macho image of himself as the kind of the ultimate man, which you don't have that many writers competing for that title, right? And he really is the one. And it's really remarkable because as destructive as his life becomes, you can go on Instagram or Facebook and the internet and find so many people today who still want to emulate Hemingway, right? And thinking like, it doesn't end well. And they, they don't care, right? Um, all his marriages fail. They're like, so what? Uh, his kids don't always like him. They don't mind, right? So it's this hard drinking, hard charging, serious, uh, involved in all these wars, always catching the biggest fish, always going to Africa and hunting the biggest animals. This real kind of machismo uh, that he cultivates as part of his image uh, which is really, really intriguing. And you could have a whole whole thing on just that, right? Um, some of his time in Key West, along with part of that image in Key West, he actually has a whole thing where he offers people money if they can beat him in boxing matches. So random people will just challenge him and that's part of his whole shtick, right? You don't, you do not see Fitzgerald doing that. I can tell you right now, that is not his style, right? That's not my style either. That's not most people's style, but that's part of what Hemingway is cultivating. Um, there he is, right? So we get this really kind of youthful sporting character. As much as he hates war, he's doomed to live in the 20th century and wars keep happening and he keeps going back. So he goes to the Spanish Civil War in the 1930s, uh, which is the rise of fascism in Spain, right? And this is a, this is a war probably just as complicated as World War I in terms of understanding the sides. And I mean, we don't have time to really even get into it, but it's very complicated. And on the one side, you have the fascists who are also kind of the more traditionalists in the military. And the other side, you have a lot of different groups. You have Republicans, you have communists, you have socialists, and you have a lot of internationals, people from the West who decide somebody has to stop fascism. Let's do it in Spain. And so they just go there to do that. Uh, George Orwell goes to fight. This is before he's famous. He goes to Spain just to fight in the Civil War because he says someone has to do something about fascism, right? Hemingway is too old to really fight, and so he goes as a journalist. His journalism is not good journalism in the sense that it's not objective. <laughs> he definitely has a side, and it's the anti-fascist side. And he also was involved with, um, we'll come back to that in a second, right? He also was involved in a documentary, The Spanish Earth, which he basically produces and then also does the narration. And actually, if you go to YouTube, you can just stream it for free, right? So you can see the whole thing and hear his voice. It's pretty cool. The Spanish Civil War is also this really traumatic event because we see targeting of civilians really directly by really advanced planes, actually German planes, right? Uh, this is the basis for this painting. Anybody know what this painting is? This is Guernica by Picasso. And it's all about the bombing of the of the town of Guernica in Spain. So there's a market day and they bomb on that day on purpose in order to get civilians and try to kind of damage the resolve of the people. So the Spanish Civil War is this brutal civil war in which lots of people are gonna die. Um, and it's also tragic because the fascists win. The fascists win and this is not the end of fascism in Europe. And if anything, it's the beginning of fascism in Europe, right? In a lot of key ways. So there's this huge disappointment that comes with that. Um, while there, he also decides to fall in love with someone else that he's also not married to yet. 
That's Martha Gellhorn. She herself is actually a very significant writer. She's a really significant war correspondent in her own right. Um, and you could read her just for reading about war correspondence. She's really good. Um, significantly younger. He goes back, tells Pauline it's over. Pauline's very disappointed. He says, well, you stole me from Hadley. She's stealing me from you. This is how life goes. Um, not a great answer, but that's what he says. And then this is also his era where he starts to fall in love with Cuba, right? Um, he goes to Cuba a lot, continues to write. World War II breaks out, another war. Here too, he's gonna get involved as a correspondent. You can see from the picture, he's starting to get a lot older, right? Um, he also briefly spends a little period of time getting extra gasoline from the US government and then patrolling around Cuba and Key West for submarines, German submarines. And there's some debate about how legitimate or illegitimate it was. On the one hand, there really were German subs <laughs> along the Atlantic coast. It's not, that's not crazy. But some people suspect he was mainly doing it to get the gasoline to go fishing and that maybe the submarines were not the priority. There's a little bit of debate about that. Um, but it's, yeah, part of his story. And then he's going to go to World War II as a correspondent, right? Um, so he's he goes back. He just keeps going back. Um, here he is. Right. He finds someone else to love on this trip as well. Um, and this is going to be the last of his wives, right? Mary Welsh, another correspondent, right? And you'll notice Hemingway's getting a lot older in these pictures. He also, he cultivates this young machismo image, but he also cultivates this older, very masculine image. And this is the era of kind of Papa. That's what he likes to be called. He kind of insists that people call him that. And so there's this whole image of Hemingway. And you can actually read, there are articles about how Hemingway is one of the only people who goes from young man to old man. He very intentionally crafts this image of himself. There's no middle age, right? He's just this really like hyper-masculine young man. And then he's like a hyper-macho old man. And there's no middle. He doesn't want a middle. And that's intentional. That's not because that's only how other people saw him. That's the image he presents uh, to the world. So a lot of, of self-crafting of image, which is very 20th century and 21st century, right? That's another one of those very modern things about him. Um, he has a whole thing. He loves cats. And anybody know what's unique about his, or more or less unique about his cats from the Key West house? Six toes. The cats have extra toes. And actually, if you visit the Hemingway house in Key West today, which is not that far from me, you, they have the descendants of those cats and they still have the extra toes. So that's a whole, whole thing. But he does like cats. He likes a lot of animals, but there are a lot of pictures of him with cats and you can meet the descendants of his his cats now. He keeps writing. That's another thing that's really remarkable about Hemingway. Is he's going to write for his whole life, right? So some of his significant books later on, To Have and Have Not, For Whom the Bell Tolls, that one is about the Spanish Civil War, Across the River and Into the Trees, The Old Man and the Sea, which we'll come back to in a minute, and then Snows of Kilimanjaro. So he keeps writing, right? Not everybody writes quite so many books. One of the things though, is that these are not all hits. <laughs> so at the very beginning, it's kind of like win, win, win. And now it's sort of like win, loss, loss, win, right? Uh, to have and have not, most people don't read it because it's not considered very good. Uh, for whom the bell tolls, some people really love it, but a lot of people still think it's not his best work, right? Cross the river and into the trees, not widely read. And so as he's getting older, people are thinking, well, he's still writing, but maybe he's lost it. He's lost his touch. He's not good anymore. The old man in the sea is really kind of when he roars back, <laughs> right? He produces another one that people say like, okay, this is really good. And so he's kind of like, I still got it, right? Um, this is a really important moment for him. And that's followed by him winning the Nobel Prize right after, right? And so there's a sense, a lot of points at which people think like, maybe he's, he's lost his touch, but here he's not lost his touch. And so he's kind of reaffirmed, he's validated again, right? Africa, which really kind of fits chronologically everywhere. Um, once he, we hit the 1930s and 20s, he has a whole thing for Africa. He loves to go to Africa. He loves to go on safari. Um, he writes about it in a lot of places. This fits in with his love of hunting, his love of the wilderness, his love of challenging situations, right? It goes back his whole life. To the end, he's actually involved in two plane crashes in Africa um, within like 48 hours, which 
add to the head injuries that he's had. That's in 1952. Um, very interesting life, right? Here he hits old age. By the time he hits old age, this man has lived a lot, right? Um, he's written all these books. He's married all these women. He's been to all of these wars. He's done all of this hunting. And he is just really depleted in a lot of ways physically, right? His whole life, he's been a hard drinker. Uh, by the time he reaches his older age, he's a pretty serious alcoholic, right? He's, he's non-functioning without it. He's functioning with it, but he's pretty much non-functioning without it. So that's a big thing. He's suffering from depression, right? He has a lot of depression issues. His health isn't really great. You can see that big scar on his forehead if you look there. Head injuries throughout his life has also not been good for him. And that's one of those things that maybe 50 years we didn't really think about. But as we've kind of changed our understanding of head injuries and head traumas, in the last few years, a lot of scholars have started to re kind of reconsider the impact of those head injuries on his life, including the depression and the drinking and the relationships, right? Um, he's not getting along with his final wife very well. And he's going to end up uh, committing suicide. That's how he dies in 1961. He dies by suicide, right? And so it's not, not really a happy end for him. And his life was really not great by that point. Again, just physical de decline in his last few years, right? So he's physically very much depleted. Um, and then he has this whole legacy. There's a great uh, Hemingway as Papa figure, right? This kind of um, older wise man image that he cultivates, right? And so we see these themes in his work and these themes in his life being very much parallel, right? If we think about what are the big themes in his work? War is a big theme, trauma often related to war, these tragic figures, right? We didn't have time to get into all the characters from the novels, but a lot of them have some, some tragic aspect to them, some sad thing that has happened that's haunting them or preventing them from having good relationships in the present right? Disappointment, loss, love, the human condition, right? You can think even about the old man in the sea, if you're familiar with that, just the hard, the hard ways that life is, right? Um, and how challenging it is. And you can think that you are going to win and then you lose in the end anyway, right? Um, and a lot of that is paralleled by themes in his life, war and trauma in his life, right? He hates war and he ends up going to so many wars, right? And they keep happening. They just keep happening. Um, Suicide, his father's and his own. Suicide is also a theme that is present in his works as something that people think about, right? He's gonna end up doing it. Challenging relationships, not just in his books, but in his own lives, his own life, right? Both his marriages and with friends and with his kids. And then also kind of this idea of masculinity being a really big theme, especially in his life, maybe even more than in his writing, but really in both, right? And so we see this really interesting legacy and like I said, one of the fascinating things about Hemingway is so many people want to be him so badly, um, despite thinking like, well, that's a lot of wars and a lot of head trauma and a lot of drinking and depression. And yet people are just this image of Hemingway, right? They kind of can't um, get past it, right? This, this guy, they want to be this guy, right? Uh, there's just something about it. And then being a successful writer as well, like who, who couldn't love that? And so Hemingway is just this larger than life figure, both on and off the page, right? And so he leaves us, again, I think more than a lot of other authors, this off the page legacy from his life where people really wanna emulate his life and they idealize his life despite knowing all the facts. That's one of the things that's very different with him and other 20th century writers. A lot of great 20th century writers, he's one of them. But this whole, this whole notion of his, his life being a thing that you would want to have for yourself or be model your own life on. That's one of the things that's unique about him compared to a lot of other writers. Um, we just don't see that so much. Yeah, so I think uh, there's probably some time for questions. And so maybe pause there. I'm ready to stop sharing too. Thank you so much. Yeah, first thank of all. you so much, it was great. Jonathan, did you wanna start? I, I have a few questions. I'll just do them little by little here. So one question after you just concluding, um, one thing I was wondering, what are some lessons that we can learn from him about his life? And especially um, remembering the idea of how his life ended. Like, what are some things we can take from his writing, from his personal life? And especially just as, you know, so many, as you said, so many people strive to be him. So what do you think are some lessons that we can learn from his writing paralleled with his own personal life that we can take away from that? Yeah, I think 
most people are not learning the lessons that are there to be learned when it comes to Hemingway, right? Um, so people want to have that life and they're not really thinking about how it ends, right? I think the lessons we might take if we're trying not to have a similar ending would be not to engage at all the practices, right? So um, yeah, the excessive drinking from a very young age, that doesn't, that doesn't end well for him. And he's not the only one. Fitzgerald, Fitzgerald has a serious alcohol problem throughout his life. He writes a whole article for Esquire about how, called The Crack Up, about how he's, his life is basically falling apart and alcohol is part of the reason. So I think being less cavalier about things like that would be a big part of it. Um, Hemingway seems to be following his joy, if you will, when he keeps finding all these new relationships, but he's ultimately unhappy in all of them, right? And so I think this idea that just finding a new person will, will make the next stage better turns out not to be true if we actually look at his life, right? So I think that's true. On the other hand, positive lessons we can learn from him. Again, he was super disciplined as a writer. Uh, regular writing, daily writing, being very serious about that, being very serious about being clear headed when you're writing. I think that's something which a lot of people don't adopt, that type of discipline, that type of seriousness he had for his craft, right? His longevity as a writer, that's really special. I think that's that's something people don't always appreciate. And his appreciation of the truth, even if you don't do it in exactly the same way he did, the idea that what you need, what you should be writing should be true to life, uh, should reflect true things about the nature of life. I think that's a positive legacy as well. So jumping jumping off of what you just said there about the truth, I wanted to, I, I had a question similar to that, but I want to um, add add to what to the original question was. Um, what do you would you? Oh, I'm trying to remember exactly what it was. Would you say that there is a good amount that we can learn? from the end, like how do you think that the end of his life and the beginning of his life complement and compare with one another, especially in terms of his writing? Yeah, so this is a thing, there's people who focus pretty much on just this, right? So there's a lot of different ways in which we can look at it, right? His father suffered from depression and committed suicide. Hemingway suffers from depression and commits suicide. So some people would say, do the intervening events even really matter that much? Or did he maybe have some predisposition that ended up not being addressed or treated? Um, was it the trauma of war? There are plenty of plenty of wartime survivors who end up com committing suicide, right? Survivor guilt is a real thing. We see that with the wars from Iraq and Afghanistan. We see it with every conflict. So to some extent, maybe there were earlier moments for intervention, right? Uh, based on both his personal history and his lived experience of, of war and trauma. So a lesson we might learn there would be addressing those things more. The same for the head traumas, right? Those certainly don't help. There's a link between head trauma and suicide. So there are a lot of reasons why it could have ended the way he, it did. Alcohol was not taken as seriously then as it is now in terms of addiction, right? Um, people weren't routinely going into recovery. AA doesn't even start until like what, mid 20th century. So part of it is I think we live in an era in which it's more likely, especially if you're growing up in America, that someone's going to try to get you to do something about any of those situations, right? Uh, if people notice that you're suffering from depression, they're probably gonna encourage you to get some kind of intervention to do something to address that. Um, with war, I think there's more attention to the trauma that people experience. Remember World War I is the first one in which we start really talking about post-war trauma, right? That's the first time we start talking about shell shock, which in World War II is called battle fatigue. But that's, that's all new to the 20th century. So I think for Hemingway, the unfortunate thing is the era he's living in is in which people are experiencing all the downsides of those things, but they don't necessarily have terms and approaches for them that begin to exist by the time it gets to maybe the 1970s, 1980s, and later. So he's just a little too late and a little too early at the same time. Um, and so, yeah, I think today it would be somewhat less likely that he would have the outcome that he did without more people trying to intervene in ways that we have more evidence backing being helpful. Yes, great, thank you. Okay, so you know, going back to what you said about the true statement, which I found when I when I read that statement by him, I was absolutely blown away. What would you say, how, how would you measure the extent to which a statement ought to be true? Because like I noticed what you said about where he said like, oh, he was talking about the things that I was talking about, about rape and about like alcohol. So like, would you say that there's a boundary and how far is that boundary in terms of writing? 
Yeah, I don't know that it has to do so much with specific content. So another person who's actually really useful to read on this, who very few people I think talk about, would be, um, there's a 19th century Russian literary critic, last name Belinsky, and he he really gets this too. And he talks about truth being the measure for literature. And so, yeah, not necessarily that every scene is like graphically accurate or every aspect of humans is, is covered in, in your pages, right? But the idea that even if you're writing fiction, it has to reflect the true nature of reality, right? And so if it shows something about society or about people that's not true, then it's a bad book. It's Belinsky's judgment, right? So he has a whole famous letter he writes to Gogol, Nikolai Gogol, uh, condemning Gogol because Gogol is like a bad book, according to him. And in this book, the crime is that uh, the serfs are shown to be happy with the, with the, owner, with the landlords, right? And so Belinsky says, this is a, this is a lie. Because people who are who are serfs, people who are enslaved, are not happy being enslaved. And so any depiction that you have that's showing like people are cool with the situation that they're in, right? That would be like if you wrote a book about uh, the United States and the slavery era and you showed like, oh, the slaves are actually, you know, mostly they get along, you know. Uh, Belinsky would say that's a bad book, not because that character isn't doesn't look like a real person or whatever, but because that's just like not true. From reality, right. Yeah. Passion from reality. Yeah, and I think that's where actually Hemingway, even though he ends up having a very sad life, he doesn't show his characters being super happy in the world that they're in, right? So they're drinking and they're partying and they're, you know, cheating on people and they're just kind of living these dissolute lives, but they're also like very profoundly sad. So in that sense, his his stories are also very true, right? Whereas a, a bad book, according to Belinsky, or probably according to Hemingway, would be one in which you're doing all these things that actually don't bring pleasure, but they're shown to bring pleasure, right? Um, so, and that, I think that's really, so the, the actual subject matter is gonna depend on the author and what they feel comfortable writing and what they feel called to write about. But the question is whether or not it reflects something true about the nature of, of society and of humans and of reality. Right, that's great, thank you. Um, let me see. How big would you say his, well, this is, it's. I think the questions can kind of overlap. How big of an author, in terms of like the broad scope, considering all the authors, Shakespeare, Dickens, Tolstoy, first, where would you put, where do you think you would put uh, Hemingway in terms of like big influence, big con contribute contributor? And also, how do you think his influence has influenced our century and our, our literary time? Yeah, so I would put him right up there. Uh, especially for the 20th century, he's got to be top three, right? Maybe number one in a lot of ways. And really for, for all time, because again, his style of writing is familiar to us now, but it was unfamiliar at the time, right? And so he's a real pioneer in how people write, like just the style and what they do. And also again, groundbreaking in terms of like what can be discussed, right? That's a big thing. Um, yeah, actually, Ken Burns did a Hemingway documentary. I don't know if you guys are big Ken Burns fans out there, but got a three-part special on Hemingway, and they interview a lot of different writers in that documentary, and one of them talks about how living post-Hemingway, you can't not be affected by him if you are a writer. Everyone mimics him in some way, and if you're not mimicking him, it's conscious. You're consciously saying, like, I'm not writing like Hemingway, right? So anytime that people have to either they know that they're either writing a little bit like you or they're defining themselves by not writing about you, you're a pretty big deal, right? And again, I think that's where his, the volume of his work kind of sets him apart. There's a good argument for The Great Gatsby maybe being the great American novel, but you can't run off a list of like five great books by Fitzgerald, right? People don't define their writing by whether or not it looks like Fitzgerald's writing. But for him, anyway, they, they absolutely do, right? And so maybe he was the great American writer, even if The Great Gatsby is a really, really good book, you know, for a lot of people. Um, but there's there's definitely an argument to be made for, for plenty of his books potentially being the great American novel as well, right? Uh, the Sun Also Rises, that's one of those books that people are going to be reading, you know, we're reading it 100 years later. It'll probably still be read 100 years from now, right? The Sun Also Rises and Farewell to Arms being really, really significant books. And even The Old Man in the Sea in a lot of ways, right? All right, so another question is, 
at the beginning, like as you were just said about how he was very much concise versus specific in the, the details. So how do you think that 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 uh, tension between the two played together? Because you have the romantics of the 19th century who are all about their flowery writing and, and just like making sure that they just had everything. Versus Hemingway, who's like, I'm willing to sacrifice that I don't get everything, but at least it's shorter. So how would you, what's your take on the tension between um, concision versus specific? Yeah, so you can definitely be concise and not great. I think what sets Hemingway apart is he's able to be concise and to make all that other stuff implied. So even though it's not there in the words, you still know what's going on. He can describe someone in just a few words, but in your head, you know what they look like. Um, he can give you a scene in which someone's not talking about what they're really thinking about, but you're pretty sure you know what they're thinking about, right? And so in the earlier eras where everything was more often explicit, he is really good at making things implicit. And I think that's why, I mean, because we don't go back and read just a bunch of newspaper columns for the 19 teens. Like, Look at this, it's so concise, right? Um, we read him because it's so concise and yet it communicates so much. I think that's what's special about him and his ability to do that. And that's not something everyone could do. Lots of people were newspaper writers and not all of them became great other kinds of writers. You know, and he was influenced by other people as well. Ring Lardner was someone that he read a lot. Um, different, different figures like that. And guided by people, Gertrude Stein, uh, they have very different styles, but she read his work when he was up and coming and gave him feedback and helped connect him to journals and to different important writers and editors, all that kind of stuff. So he also benefits from other people, too. It's not just it's not like no one else has any of these ideas and only he has these ideas, but he's basically probably the most excellent at at doing those things, those practices and doing them in a way which works, uh, which not everyone can do. I think you're muted, Jonathan, if you had another question. No, okay. Uh, I wanted to ask one more. I think it's probably all we have time for, but um, following up on the, the write the truest sentence, you know, um, idea, you said we were talking about how it's really a reflection of reality and like a robust reflection of reality um, and that it's less maybe about the subject matter. Um, but I did want to ask about your kind of guesses about how he would guide someone to choose their subject matter and what what subjects, uh, how a, a subject becomes the truest one to someone, like maybe bullfighting for him, for example. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think Hemingway would tell you there are no guides, right? Um, you should just write about anything, really. I think in his in his time, exposing more of the dark underbelly of humanity was more of the moment that they were in, right? And, I, and a lot of World War I authors were that way, right? So they came out thinking, I was fed a very romanticized, beautiful version of life, and that turned out to be false. And so I need to tell people how ugly life is and how ugly people are, right? There's some of the World War I poetry, if you read it, where, I mean, Siegfried Sassoon or, um, yeah, Wilfred Owen, right? And they're thinking, like, you were fed the Odyssey and the Iliad, and I'm going to describe to you someone choking to death on poison gas because that's what war really is, right? And you're like, well, this is really graphic and like distressing. And they're like, that's life, right? And so I think for Hemingway, it's like people aren't talking about the ways that people actually live and the ways that they're sad and the ways that they hurt themselves and the ways that they hurt other people. So that's what kind of needs to be written. I don't know that that's our biggest need in 2024, um, tell people that they have this dark underbelly. Um, on the other hand, I think there's always a value in showing people ways in which, because I think sometimes we can see that about society, but not ourselves, right? And so I think if you think about um, Notes from the Underground by Dostoevsky, we read that in our honor sequence. And it's funny to me because all the things we read that upsets the students the most sometimes because it makes them feel gross. And then if we get far enough into the conversation, some will say, well, Honestly, I think maybe part of the reason I hate this book so much is I a little bit relate to this character because I can be kind of petty and I can be dumb and really difficult for people and make bad choices. And I don't like that I can relate to this character because I really, really dislike him so much. And I think actually um, 
this is also graphic and not PG, but that series Beef, which was, uh, I think, just got an Emmy and it's on Netflix, I think is actually very similar to Notes from the Underground in terms of revealing just the depth of human depravity and how messed up we are on the inside and how many bad choices we make. So I don't know that like society needs to know more about societal ills, but I think there's always an audience because we always like to forget for like the true nature of our own personal ills, just as human beings and how all of us have those traits and not just like those people or certain, uh, certain categories of society. Um, all of us can be really petty, <laughs> you know? So I don't, I don't know that that's ever gonna go out of style in terms of needing to be portrayed to people in a true way. That's really helpful. Very insightful. Well, now I wish we had more time so we could talk about beef. That was a great show. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for your time and and your thoughtful comments and lecture. And Jonathan, thank you for your excellent questions. I'm really glad you were here. Yes, you're very welcome. Thank you. All right. I appreciate you both very much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us.